Have you ever considered a career in space sailing? We're going to be talking today with a NASA astronaut as well as a high school physics teacher. How do you make that decision, high school physics teacher or astronaut? Joining us for this conversation are Mr. Amundsen, a 17-year physics teacher here in the school district of Menominee Falls. He also is the girls varsity basketball coach and has been doing that for about 13 years. Joining also in this conversation is a special guest to our school district, Dr. Sandra Magnus. Dr. Sandra Magnus is a NASA astronaut and is going to be talking about her missions as well as her inspiration for becoming an astronaut. Welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Let's begin by talking a little bit about uh, science and the importance of science in what it is both of you do for a living. Uh, when is it that you became interested in science and decided to become a high school science teacher? I don't know. I, I guess when we were talking earlier, that I enjoyed the part where um, deriving stuff and and how everything we did, we could lead up to where, where it came from. Like whenever we do physics problems, you know, we derive everything. So it's kind of fun to know where everything comes from and what it leads to. And it's pretty hard to not be inspired by, you know, seeing rainbows and the sunset and the sunrise and how things work. So it's pretty fun, it's just an overall fun time. Okay, so it was your curiosity about that. Oh, yeah. Wanting to explore mm -hmm. early on. Did you have this interest? Did you? It was either, it was either um, I remember growing up, uh, it was either a civil engineer or a science teacher and then I worked in this program when I went to college uh, a pre-civil engineering program where in the summer you could work as a civil engineer and I hated it it was too repetitive for me um, and I just said I probably the best thing that ever happened in the engineering field was me not liking it and so then teaching has been just a blast since then I mean it's overall 19 years but I've just been having so much fun. So it's been a blast. Oh yeah, oh, well, yeah no pun intended. <laughs> So you do like what you chose. Oh, yeah. Oh, great, yeah. great. And Dr. Magnus, how about you? When did you become inspired in science and curious and decided on this particular path? Oh, I remember when I was younger, my parents bought me this book, 200 Questions Why, because I kept bugging them, why does this do this? Why, you know, why is the moon following us when we're driving? Why does this work this way? Why does this work this way? And so I think I've always been curious about how the world works. And physics, of course, is a great place to go to understand how the world works, and you can take that. And I did like engineering, but uh, so you can take the physics and you can do the engineering to, to do things with that. And I think you know Craig and I share the the, the same love of the physical sciences and, and understand how the world works, and the, the love of sharing that with with students and, and getting them excited about it too. We're in the television studio here in Menominee Falls High School. What do you remember about your high school science classes that may have contributed to your career choice? Well, certainly you remember your teachers. You know, your teachers make such an impact on you when you're going through school. And, and when you have teachers who are very excited about what they're teaching, who are, who are very enthusiastic, that leaves a mark. And I've been very fortunate that I've always had very good science teachers uh, through high school and, in, and on. Okay, so you, you got interested and maintained that interest during high school and then decided to go on to college. And what did you decide to study when you went on to college? Well, I, I studied physics, of course, okay. and it, it's a great foundation for doing lots of other things. I, I took my physics background and, and I expanded on that in engineering and materials and other, other fields, but it's always physics is the baseline, physics is the foundation. You understand how the world works and like I mentioned, you can take that and you can move it anywhere and, and do anything with it. So you've got a, a bachelor's and a master's in engineering, and then a doctorate in? Yeah, my bachelor's is actually in physics, okay. and then my master's is in electrical engineering, and then I went and studied material science for my PhD. Okay, and when is it that the idea of becoming an astronaut a, a, in, in terms of a way to earn a living um, piqued your interest? Well, don't tell anybody, but I, I would do it for free <laughs> if, if they wanted me to, but it is a great way to, it's, it's a great way to earn a living. And I was in middle school okay. when uh, I got the bug to, I was like, hey, you know, I think I want to go try that. And, and as a little girl, you know, you don't know what's possible or what's not possible. And, and really, you just whatever your dream is, whether it's an astronaut or a teacher, you, you need to try for it. You need to go for it. And that's, I think, another thing that, that we both do when we speak to students is try and, and impart that and drive. Now, was Sally Ride uh, an impact uh, or influential at all in terms of um, the possibilities that you saw as a, as a woman going into space travel? You know, it's interesting that you ask that because in 1978 I was starting my freshman year in college, mm -hmm. I mean in high school, okay. and when I started that high school uh, year there was an article in the newspaper about the first group of women astronauts 
astronauts who to be selected. Mm -hmm. And you know, of course, Shelley, Sally was part of that group, and Shannon Lucid, and and I've since met a lot of these women. Shannon is still in the office, and it's and it's very exciting to meet these women who basically blazed the path that allowed me uh, to become an astronaut a little bit easier than if I was in that first generation. So I, I, I'm really appreciative of the work that they did and they're just such wonderful people that, yeah, they, they have had an impact. Now, uh, I always thought that the astronauts came out of a military background. I always thought they were selected because of their piloting skills and their interest in science as well. But that's not, that's not, or no longer true, is it? No, it's not. You know, of course the program started like that because when we first started flying human beings uh, out of the Earth's atmosphere, we weren't quite sure what to expect. And, and the test pilots, for example, in the military had certain kinds of training that were going to be very beneficial for going into an unknown area like that. But as we understood more and more about what we were dealing with and we were expanding the space program to incorporate all of the science and experimentation that we do today, the list of candidates who could be qualified for the job expanded into scientists and engineers and non-military non, uh, people. All right. So you decided then at, at, later on in your education that this is how, what you wanted to do. How did you go about uh, pursuing becoming a NASA astronaut? Well, of course, the first prerequisite is study hard and, and uh, get the degrees that you need to get. It was very useful to have some work experience. Uh, I got hired at McDonnell Douglas right out of college after my physics degree, and I worked there for four and a half years before going back to finish school with my doctorate. And after that, I finally applied to NASA because I felt like my resume was, was prepared as much as I could do mm -hmm. to prepare for it. And there's not always job openings for astronauts, are there? No, what happens is you, you have to put your application in, and then they, they will contact you every year to up, update your application. Mm -hmm. When they're ready to select a class, mm -hmm. they make an announcement, and usually there's a cutoff date somewhere around the 1st of July of the year. They're going to start the selection process. And any application that has been on file and has been updated will be eligible to be considered. To, to be considered. And so then they you know, sort of have that cutoff date, and then everybody on file starts, they start going through the process of, of going through the application. So what year was it that your application was uh, accepted? I was selected in the 1996 class. So I've been there for about 13 and a half years. And how many people were in your class? 35. We had a very large class. We're actually on record as the largest group ever selected. Um, normally a class size is around 20 people. Okay. We were a very large class because they were starting to ramp up for space station knowing that the crew requirements were going to be a little bit greater because we were going to have three, uh, a six person crew eventually on station and there's a little bit of a lead time because you have to go through training. Mm -hmm. So the odds were good my mm -hmm. year, you know, <laughs> 35 do, do instead of 20. Do you get promised missions when you, when you are accepted? No, you basically come in as an astronaut candidate, you go through basic training which is usually around two years and then you're eligible for a mission assignment. And then, uh, you know, whenever they assign crews, whether it's station crews or shuttle crews, you're looking for the right skill mix. Mm -hmm. so we all have, you know, strengths and weaknesses in different areas. And then eventually you'll, you get on a crew and, and then you can fly. Is there politics in that selection of who gets to fly? Well, we try not to make it political. I mean, ideally what you're looking for when you put a crew together is the right mix of experience with inexperience because you want people to get experience. It's important for the astronaut office to always have a strong base of experienced astronauts but you need some experienced people on each mission to train. There's certain things you only learn about when you're on orbit. You want experienced people on every crew with the rookie so that we can all train each other. You want, you know, you want good skills with uh, organizational skills. You want good communication skills. You want good spacewalking skills. You want good robotic skills. You want someone who can do the medical piece of it. So these are the kinds of things that you look for when you put a, sh a, a, a space crew together, basically, is how to balance all these skill mixes. Okay. Craig, uh, Sandra has been, had an opportunity to speak to a lot of our students and our science students in particular today. Um, what is it that interested them in terms of their ability, their, their uh, opportunity to have a conversation with? Well, you know, I, I was telling her that we, for all the kids that she got to meet with, you know, with, with the lunch or the dinner or whatever, I had them fill out a questionnaire. And one of them was why they would like to, to meet her. And there were questions ranging from, the opportunity to meet someone who's real passionate about their field and how did you find about that passion mm -hmm. and um, there were opportunities kids wanting to go into science and not necessarily aeronautics or anything like that but they just a lot of them just like science and get the opportunity to meet with scientists and what do scientists do because because really I mean a space shuttle astronaut seems pretty cool but they're also scientists and they do the same things that we do at a much different level and so a lot of the kids are interested in science and want to do science so I think that was probably the main reason. The main reason. Application yeah. is something that they're already interested in yeah. and in, in a very creative and innovative, mm -hmm. innovative field as well. 
Um, Sandra, you, you've done two missions. The first one was an, just, uh, just, an or, <laughs> just, just in orbit. Um, tell us a little bit about that first mission. Yeah, my first mission was a short duration mission. Basically, it was part of a space shuttle crew whose job it was to deliver a piece of the space station and add it to the space station. Just 4.5 million miles, I think. It was short, it was. yeah, it was uh -huh. short, just four and a half million miles. Frequent flyer miles yeah. given for that? Unfortunately not, <laughs> I could travel forever on just that mission. But we were only there for 11 days, we went to the space station, visited, it was a very nice introduction as a first time flyer to what the space station was all about and kind of get a glimpse of what it might be like to live there. Uh, and that was in 2002. And then, of course, my recent mission was a long duration mission that I just returned from last and, year. And this longer duration uh, had you on this, uh, in, in the space station mm -hmm. for how long of a period of time? I lived you? there for four and a half months. That's a long time. Yeah, and it's, it's nice because when you're there on the shuttle, you're, you're very busy. It's a very short period of time. You have very certain specific things that you need to get done in that time frame. And so you don't have a chance to really sit back and take in the environment because okay. you're so busy, 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 busy. And so living there, you know, it's, it's your lifestyle. You develop a lifestyle, it's your life. It's normal for you to be floating around. And, and so it's a completely different experience uh, okay. being there for a long period of time. We're going to talk a little bit more about that time in the space station, but first we've got some video that we'd like you to talk us through. Okay. And this video begins, I believe, with your training. There's some, some pictures of you during the training process and uh, preparing for a spacewalk, as well as the launch, the orbit itself. And, um, and there's some video that goes along with it. So why don't we roll that and, uh, and also then listen to Dr. Sandra Magnus as she tells us about these photos. Well, of course, we do a lot of, of practice uh, for the launch and landing uh, time frame, and we put on these orange suits. We do a lot of survival training if we have to jump out of the orbiter. We do some training for long duration. This was some training underwater in a habitat that the United States has uh, off of Key Largo. We lived there for a week. We uh, do a practice launch where we go out to the pad and, and practice getting strapped in. We have spacewalk training uh, in the big pool where we put on the white suit and practice underwater. For launch, it was actually quite spectacular. My second launch was a night launch. You know, the engines light six seconds before the actual takeoff to make sure the engines are okay. And it lights up the whole area, so at night it becomes like day. At T equals zero, those solid rocket boosters light up and uh, you definitely know you're going somewhere. It's over 7 million pounds of thrust pushing you up off of the planet and uh, away you go to orbit. It really only takes about eight and a half minutes to get there, so it's a very short ride. We get on orbit, the main engine's cut off, we're floating in our seats. We jettison, of course, the solid rocket boosters on the way up. We only, we only use those for two minutes. On orbit, when we get there six and a half minutes later, we jettison the, the external tank, which you'll see here in a moment. That external tank is what fuels the shuttle main engines. We only use the main engines during the launch process. We, they're not used for the whole rest of the mission. As you know, we're a, a very heavy glider when we come back for landing. There are no engines involved, so the pilots uh, and the commanders have to train to get that right the first time. This is a piece of the space station truss. This is what we took up in our first mission. We reached into the payload bay of the shuttle with the robot arm and picked up the 45,000-pound uh, truss and, and moved it over to the station. Peggy Whitson, who was a space station resident at the time, and myself, we drove the robot arm to do that work. It's, uh, it is quite challenging. You do need two people to operate the robot arm. There's a little break there in the action. Had a moment to eat a tortilla, which are very tasty on orbit, I might add. Uh, it, was, it was a lot of fun eating in space and adapting. The first mission, Peggy uh, was a station resident, and then Pam and I were shuttle crew members, so we had some very nice pictures of the three of us in space. It was, uh, it was a really nice time. This is actually a big bag I'm in. It was kind of a fun picture for the ground. We transfer things in these big refrigerator bags, and I was the transfer queen on that particular mission, so we were joking around and, and uh, pretending like we were going to transfer me to, to the station, but I had to come home. Exercise is very important in space. On space station, we exercise two hours a day. On the shuttle, we kind of grab it when we need, when we can. Your body starts to deteriorate after about two weeks, and so you really, wow. if you're going to be there for a long period of time, you really, really need to seriously take the exercise carefully. The shuttle's a lot like uh, camping. We put our sleeping bags up and uh, sleep at night attached to ourselves to the wall. During the day, we have to roll them up and put them out of the way because that's our living space as well as our sleeping space. The, I'm actually here on the far left, and there's a galley next to me, so that's our kitchen too. So it really is a, a studio apartment, if you will. This is a view of the shuttle approaching the space station. To the right there, you see that kind of circular ring on the, the structure. That's the docking port. To the left, you see the two overhead windows, and 
that little white area to the left around those windows, that's our living space on the shuttle. It's quite small, especially compared to the space station, which is incredibly huge. Uh, both vehicles are going 17,500 miles per hour when we dock. The differential velocity is about a tenth of a foot per second, so it's a very delicate operation and we do a lot of practice. Usually every mission involves some spacewalks of some kind. There's a lot of training that goes into a spacewalk. It's not a straightforward thing to do. We use the buddy system, of course, so you always see at least two people out there. And we support the spacewalk with that robot arm that I mentioned uh, Peggy and I had flown earlier. We usually have them helping out. This is a nice series of videos flown from the fly around that we did after we left the, sh the station back March. This is what it looks like today for the most part. And it, it's really hard to appreciate the size here, but if you look from one end of that truss to the other where the solar arrays span, that's about the length of a football field to give you a feel for how, so how big the station is. And down the main axis, you see those cylindrical modules. That's also about the length of a football field. All too soon, though, it seemed like it was time to come home. We land in Florida primarily. That's our, our, our ideal uh, landing site. It's a glider. It's a controlled fall from orbit all the way to the landing site. A lot of smart people do a lot of really good calculations to get us home safely. And uh, then you're back to Florida and home. And for me, it was interesting because I was now back to gravity after four and a half months mm -hmm. on orbit being weightless. And that's just a quick shot of the shuttle crew that picked me up along with on the far right, Koichi Wakata who took my place. He was going to be the first long duration Japanese astronaut. It's, it, it's important to emphasize here that the space station is an international project, project and we have people from all over the world flying up there and living up there. And is English the official language of the space station? It, it is the official language, however we use Russian when we mm -hmm. speak to the Russian Control Center. They have a space flight history as rich and as long as ours. Mm -hmm. and, with the and cosmonauts. With the cosmonauts. So the cosmonauts learn English, mm -hmm. we learn Russian, mm -hmm. and we speak English to everybody except the Russian Mission Control and we speak Russian to them. Okay. And on board we speak a mixture okay. of both. All right, let's go back. <clears throat> Two years of of training in order to get prepared. How many of your class lasted for that full two years? Oh, everybody does. Everybody yeah. does. They're very good about the selection process. You, they, you, really, it's, it, you really don't want to select someone into the program who you don't think can get mm -hmm. through the training. Um, it's not very and, efficient. And are, what kind of requirements are there in terms of ability to see, ability to, to go under underwater, ability to be able to be weightless, um, to, to not get motion sick? What, what kind of re requirements, physical requirements, are there for an astronaut? Really, it's, it's not as severe as it once was back mm -hmm. before we really understood uh, how to operate in the environment. But the, there's some pretty severe medical restrictions. And so a lot of the interview process is the medical screening that they do. And okay. that's the big, the big requirement. Okay. Mm -hmm. Was there anything in the training during those two years that you did particularly well or really enjoyed doing and looked forward to doing in space? Well, you know, I think the best thing about the training was, well, first of all, knowing that someday you were going to get mm -hmm. to go to space and apply it, but was just the fact that we get to learn new things every day. I learned things, um, earth science, you know, we, they taught us some earth science because we do so much astronaut photography and, and we're sort of monitoring the health of the planet with this photography and sharing these observations with the earth scientists. So you have to learn a little bit about that field in order to take pictures of the appropriate things and that was fascinating because that was a new field for me. Uh, medical stuff, we had to learn how to become first responders, you know, not quite at the paramedic level but at the point where we can stabilize someone if they are having a medical issue in orbit and that was new to me and that was very exciting. Uh, I am a guinea pig for a lot of medical experiments. We all are. It's part of our jobs. Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. and so you learn a little bit about biology and, and human uh, experiments and things like that. And that's also very interesting. So I think that the most fun was just learning a little bit about all these different fields and getting exposed to all these different areas. It's a lot of fun. Now, during the launch, before we started, I joked and asked you if it was different or similar to taking off in an airplane. And you said significantly different. Um, you were just mentioning that it takes, what did you say, about eight, eight and a half minutes mm -hmm. for, from the time that you're on the ground to the time that you're actually up in space. Mm -hmm. What are you doing during that time? Are your eyes open? Are you breathing, you know, doing some yoga breathing? I mean, what, <laughs> what, what is it that, you're, that you're, you're feeling? Are you smiling? I mean, is this, is this something that, that uh, or are you very serious and, and studying an instrument panel during that time? Well, people have different jobs during the launch process, and everyone, of course, is smiling somewhere. Um, if you're on the flight deck, your, your main job during the launch and landing process is to monitor the system and make sure the orbiter is behaving appropriately. 
because if the automatic systems are not behaving appropriately, you need to take over manually, and we do a lot of training in order to be able to do that. So they're very seriously on the flight deck. In my first mission, I was on the flight deck, so you're very seriously concentrating. Did you have to take over manually? Or no, we okay, don't. It's so very rare, but we do enough. train for it because you really need to be able to react mm -hmm. instantaneously if something mm -hmm. goes wrong. Of course, a little part of you is inside going, oh, go to space, go to space. So even though you're very seriously focused on the instruments, part of you is very excited. On the, on the mid deck, you're, you're more, more, or less, more or less passengers, and you, you don't have any technical duties during that time frame, so you can more sit there and more or less enjoy the ride, as it were, without worrying about heavy responsibilities. Now, there's lots of photography that's involved in this. Tell mm -hmm. us a little bit, bit about some of the pictures that you were able to take. Oh, it's, that's really, it's something that I, I found myself really enjoying photography, and I'm not much of a photo taker here on the ground, but on orbit I, I just couldn't help myself. And we've had people take upwards of 60,000 photos in, in a six-month increment. Uh, they send us, the Earth Observations team sends us specific, maybe a list of five or ten photos of areas that they know we're going over on any given day that they'd like to take for these, these purposes of, of helping the Earth scientists monitor the health of the planet. In the meantime, we also take photos just because we see so many interesting, beautiful, wonderful sights out the window. And uh, you never get tired of doing that. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were some, some places around the world that are just fascinating for me. And I really enjoyed taking pictures. Now, we saw you strapped in in your sleeping bags to sleep. Was that difficult to sleep in that position? Did they darken the, the cabin area in order to make it easier? How, how was it that you got yourself to fall asleep? And actually, that, that was interesting, because the first, the first night I was in orbit after, and my first mission, I did feel like I was falling. Of course, I'm in free fall, which is mm -hmm. why I felt that. It was very difficult to get used to sleeping in space, but I found that uh, by strapping myself very strongly into the sleeping bag, I had enough you know, kind of contact with the wall to feel like I was laying down and I was able to sleep. Of course, we turn the lights off okay. and you can shield the windows because, you know, we're going around the earth every 90 right. minutes. So every 45 minutes, there's a sunset and a sunrise. But if you cover the windows, you don't have that night day uh, light disruption bothering you. So then when you do wake up from a sleep, about how long of a sleep, sleep pattern are you in? Four hours, six hours? How, how long do they schedule us for an eight-hour sleep period. Oh, they do. They, you know, they, by, per the schedule, it's an eight-hour sleep period. In, in practicality, on station, I probably got about six hours a night. Six hours. And then you wake up. Do you know where you are? I mean, are you ever a little bit discombobulated? I mean, sometimes that happens, I think, to us in our, in our, own, our own bedrooms. Yeah, it can happen. I mean, just like normal, you wake oh. up, it's like, where am I? <laughs> um, but, uh, and then do you have but, breakfast? Do you have a cup of coffee? They, well, it's not quite a cup because okay. it would float out all over the place. We have. Um, you know, we get time in the morning, we get scheduled time, you know, we have a certain wake up time and we have a scheduled time to, you know, do morning cleanup or have breakfast and kind of get your act together to start the working day. And you have, uh, we have drink bags. Mm -hmm. And in the drink bags you can have, you know, orange juice or coffee or coffee with cream or coffee with sugar or coffee black or tea or hot chocolate. So you just add either hot or cold water and, you know, shake it around a little bit and presto whammo, you're set and ready to go. So did you get to pick your, your uh, uh, menu before you took off or did you pick it once you're, you're launched in terms of what you want to be eating and drinking? Well, on the space station we have a standard menu. Okay. 16, every 16 days you get the same food. And so there's, you know, a container of beverages, and there's a container of entrees, and there's a container of vegetables and things like this. So that can be somewhat um, difficult for four and a half months to have the same things every 60 days. So what they do is they also allow us what we call a bonus container. And so every month, for every month I was on orbit, I got to pick a food container and put things that I liked in it. And then I opened one of those a month, and then I've got to manage that and supplement that with our standard menu. And that's how we kind of balance out the difficulties of logistics and everybody picking their own food versus having 16 days over and over and over and over again of the same food. On the space station, there's uh, experiments going on. Were you involved in, the, in those experiments? Oh, yes, certainly. Everybody on board is doing experiments uh, at some point. You know, we, our days are full of a lot of different activities, and experiments are certainly a large portion of that time. And there's very interesting things going on. Of course, we have experiments from around the world. So I could be talking to the Europeans or the Japanese or the Russians or to our our science center in, in Huntsville, Alabama, here in the United States, at any given moment, about any kinds of experiments from any of these countries. And were you able to have contact with your family and friends when you were up there? Yes, we have a weekly video conference on Sundays with our families, which is really great. Mm -hmm. And email, of course, uh, they sync up our email accounts about three times a day. 
And then if, if you had a certain antenna signal, you could actually make a phone call with a okay, kind of like an internet, nice. it was kind of like an internet phone. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Uh, but you had to have a certain antenna signal. It was really great, it was we could call out, but they mm -hmm. couldn't call us. So, <laughs> so whenever you, you wanted, pick the time you, you could pick the time, time, yeah. But it was kind of fun, it was kind of funny because you'd be talking to someone on the phone, the antenna signal will go away and you might not know about it, and all of a sudden the conversation's over. So people who you call had to get used to the fact that you were talking and then you're not talking. Okay, and, they just have and to not panic about it. And it's it. okay. How about conversation with the other individuals? You were in the space station with two other individuals, mm -hmm. two men and yourself. Um, is it is it typical workday kind of conversation, or is there something that's unique or different about conversation at the space station? Well, I mean, you're you're living there together, so you're sort of like an extended family. And remember, you've trained for these people with these people as well for three years at least before the mission. And so it's just sort of everyday normal conversation. There's really nothing special one way or the other about it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Once you landed. What, what is it you wanted to do first? Take a shower, uh, have something special <laughs> to eat or drink? Uh, uh, what were some of the things that you, you were looking forward to doing after 45 days of being in space? Well, definitely a shower. The whole idea of hot water falling over the top of you and yeah. is a beautiful thing, and I missed that. And of course, for, uh, for food, that's another big thing that people, I wanted a chocolate milkshake and a salad. A chocolate milkshake and a salad. Well, you're in the I, dairy state right here, so I'm <laughs> glad to hear that. <laughs> and a salad. And right. a salad. Yeah. Fresh, some fresh, fresh produce. Fresh produce, crunchy. Crunchy, okay. Yeah. All right, very good. Um, well, I, we really appreciate the fact that not only are you visiting our high school, but that you would take this time to also share with all the viewers of Focus on Our Children um, some of your personal experience. With, uh, with NASA and your, your two opportunities to go into space. No, I'm happy to do it. I have one final question, which is the future. What is mm -hmm. it that yeah. happens next? Uh, once you've done this, now what? <laughs> now I'm at the back of the line. <laughs> now usually after you come back from a, a long duration mission, you have six weeks of rehab where you're sort of getting your earth legs back as it were and then you do a lot of public appearances and go out and share just like we're doing today and, and, and let people know what's going on at NASA and what we're doing and things like that and then you rotate back in and get a technical job in the office uh, we have various types of science and engineering jobs that we perform while we're on the ground while we're waiting to get back into training and flying again so mm -hmm. I'm sort of at the back of the line for a flight again so I have a technical job that's keeping me very busy in the, in the meantime. Very good. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you also for, for hosting this, uh, this wonderful sure. special guest Fun. here within our high school and to pique the interest of our high school students at an age where perhaps they can start making some of these decisions that may end up causing them to also uh, be space sailors, uh, mm -hmm. as, as it were, uh, astronauts going forward. That was fun. Okay. Thank you so much. That concludes this edition of Focus on Our Children, in which we were talking with Dr. Sandra Magnus, a NASA astronaut, as well as our own physics teacher here at the high school, Craig Amundsen. Thanks for watching.